One, two, test. One. Good afternoon from the TA Marisha Community College Tantine Campus Hospitality Hall. And welcome to this third panel discussion uh, for the academic year 2022-2023. My name is David Ambrose. I am a communication studies lecturer in the Department of Arts, Humanities, and General Studies in the School of Arts, Sciences, and Professional Studies of the TA Marisha Community College. I'll be your host this afternoon as we commemorate March 13th. Let me welcome you, the members of the audience here in Hospitality Hall. I'd also like to welcome all viewers on the GIS TV and uh, social media platforms. This afternoon, we're going to discuss a very important topic because at TAMCC, we always like to educate our students about Grenada's history and the personalities involved in our history. Um, today, 44 years ago, history was made in Grenada with the staging of the first ever coup d'etat in the English-speaking Caribbean. By the end of the day, the New Jewel Movement had control of Grenada, as all police stations had surrendered to them. Most government officials and even the top military and police brass of the previous government were detained, the Gary government. Many Grenadians thought the revolution was a new beginning for the country after the experiences of the turbulent 1970s. The philosophy of the revolution was to transform Grenada economically, socially, and politically. And this transformation required the participation of everyone, including the youth and women. So today's panel will discuss women in the revolution. The panelists will discuss the roles of women during the revolution and the ways in which these roles set the stage for development, for the development and empowerment of the Grenadian woman today. So permit me to introduce the panelists. Sitting next to me, we have Ms. Peggy Nesfield, who is who was a public servant during the, the period of, of the revolution. And in fact, she was a protocol officer in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Sitting next to her is Dr. Wendy Crawford Daniel, a sociology professor at the St. George's University. And uh, Dr. Crawford is also a, an author who bases her writing on her research on serious and even sometimes taboo sociological issues. She was a student leader during the revolution, and um, she was an active member of the, the then National Youth Organization and uh, National Students Council as well. Uh, she traveled all over the world representing Grenada at that time. Sitting next to Dr. Crawford Daniel is Mr. Terry Noel. Mr. Noel is a history lecturer here at TAMCC within the Department of Arts, Humanities, and General Studies. He was a degree in history with political science from the UE Cavell campus. And he was once a vice president of the Historical Society at UE. He has written articles and commentary on Arabian News Now, Now Grenada, and the Grenada, the New Today newspaper. And some of his pieces include the destruction of our revolutionary heritage, and did the Grenadian revolutionary model contribute to its demise? And at the end of this table is Mr. Kwabina Amen. Mr. Amen has been an educator for 37 years, and he's currently the community service coordinator 
here at the T.A. Marshall Community College. He's a graduate of the law program at UWE. And uh, those of you who remember IFE, the Institute for Further Education, uh, he was a main man there and also at the Grenada Boys Secondary School during the time of the revolution. So these are our panelists, ladies and gentlemen. We're going to talk about women in the revolution. But as, uh, as we begin, I'd like us to share what our experiences were on the day itself, March 13th, 1979. So we could give our students an idea of uh, what, what really happened there. So please, can you share your experiences on that day? Okay, um, I'll start. No problem. Um, I can't remember much about that day except that I was a student at Anglican High School at the time. In fact, I was all dressed and on my way um, to school when I think someone, there are a lot of activities, cars driving up and down, not sure what's really going on. It's a pretty kind of quiet day despite all the, um, all of that, I was coming. I lived in St. Paul's at the time, and and walking to school every day. That was routine. We walked to um, Tantine every day from St. Paul's and walk back after school. On the day in question, um, left home early as usual because having to walk um, would have left home maybe by seven or before seven, and so had no idea what was going on on the radio or otherwise. And on the way to school, someone stopped and said, where are you guys going? It's, um, there's no school today. I was very disappointed because there was action, definitely there was action um, going on, but you were deprived of getting much. So it's until I got home, turned around and went back home. And by then the, the radio and so in those days, no <laughs> social media, no internet, few television. So the radio, we turned on the radio and there were all of the announcements that this is the revolution, um, the Gary government has been overthrown, no school, calling people to come out to defend the community and, come and defend the country and come and uh, um, things like that. But at that time, I'm a student, it was not so much yet involved at that level with the revolution except um, as a student leader in student council activities. So um, definitely my parents would not have had me leave home and get involved at that point. So for me that day was disappointing in the sense that um, we didn't have an opportunity to really get into what's going on, but just to listen on the radio, what's going on, and feeling kind of, uh, if I could recall the feeling, feeling more left out than anything else because Definitely, I always was somebody who liked action and activity. So you just had to stay home quiet and, you know, parents there, oh, what's going on? Not sure what's going on. Everybody's wondering. But it was nice and exciting. You understand? So that's a re recall of the day for me. <laughs> okay. I was in New York working for, with home. And so we knew what was happening in a way. So we were just in waiting. And um, <laughs> I kind of fell asleep. And then the phone rang, but it was outside. So I jumped up and I forgot I had put some table there. So I crashed into it because I was running to, to know what was going on. And my leg got really messed up, but that was <laughs> keeping me from going to the phone. And when I got to the phone, that was the news. So we started working because we were working already up in New York and got bath and dress got my feet a little tended to, and was down to the embassy. We all met in the defense station and went down. That was our orders, go to the embassy. And we knew all what was happening, and that was the beginning. And I was home a few months after. So though we weren't in physically in Grenada, we, were, we knew all what was happening. We were working up there, raising funds to fund the New Jewel Movement. We did all the fundraising in New York with I remember us having um, a tea party. An <laughs> older lady, Aunt Blanche Grant, said to me one day, Peggy, you know we could do a tea party. I said, oh, we can do a tea party in New York. <laughs> and up to the day, they still have tea parties Saturday. I mean, we baked and prepared 
things for weeks, but we used to do all the fundraising in, out in the diaspora to help in whatever ways that was what was happening here. So we had our excitement, but not as what was happening here. I don't think anybody here, and I'll show you. Yeah, yeah. So let me say my involvement, uh, as far as my recollection, uh, was as a young child at the time. So uh, I was in primary school. And uh, as I remember it, my mother, um, we from Maribo, close to the Princess Alice Hospital. But my mother, originally from Mount Horn area, um, sent us to um, the Lafayette St. Mary's RC School. And um, so on my way down to school that morning, I remember in particular having a little toy, which is a little toy car that I had a string attached to dragging the little car behind me as a little boy going to school. And when we get to the, um, what we call the dam in Moncton, we saw a lot of workers going in back and forth and so on, uh, estate workers and so on, telling us go back, you know, go home, go home. Uh, it was an overthrow, it was a revolution and so on. Uh, we didn't quite understand at the time, uh, so we keep on walking and then some other people stop us and tell us, no, go back, go back, go back, children, go back home. And, and um, so that's my, uh, you know, in terms of my recollection of it. But interestingly, though, know, um, we would walk past, um, there's an old school called the Old School, which is in La Filette, which is the original school which I attended to. The new, I was in the new school, the new building, which was further down the road. And then um, we would walk past that school where Sir Eric once went, um, which we now refer to as the Old School. And I thought something should be done there to probably remember him, in remembrance of him, possible, maybe rebuild the old school and probably name it after Sir Eric or something. Um, but the original school where, um, sorry, not the original, but the, the new building which I went to, we were in front of that school with Sir Eric. Went. And so, our, so Eric was actually a student there, and then he became um, a teacher later afterwards. Um, and then after I remember, um, my mother saying, I think later on that week, that when she went to make some groceries in Grenville, she almost fainted. Because when she arrived in Grenville, she saw my older brother with a big gun guarding, guarding the police station. <laughs> because he joined, he took up arms right then and then and started, he joined the um, revolution and so on. And then I also remember that he came at one time to um, doing some security work which is with, with, with the military forces at the hospital and um, he sent information to us that he needs some food and so on. And my mother gave me some little bread and you know um, corned beef and so on to bring down for him while he was doing his duties and so forth. Well, this is basically um, my recollection. And uh, I remember one of the things I, may, I must highlight too is that the radio station when I went back home, what they were playing and so on, and Maurice Bishop's speech and so on, um, they was bombarded with kind of um, revolutionary music. And I think one of the songs that I remember is "Stand Up and Fight Back." You got nothing to lose. And I think that inspired a lot of the youths to take up arms and actually to support the revolution, which was the Jamaican, Jamaican reggae music and so on, which uh, we know that the Siaga, um, after the collapse of Siaga in Jamaica, a lot of the Jamaicans actually contributed immensely to the Grenada Revolution and so on. And maybe hence the reason we had a lot of this music playing and so on, the reggae music. And, and we stand up and fight back, we got nothing to lose. That is my recollection of the actual um, day of the overture. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I was a Form 3 student at GBSS. Um, on my way, uh, my father's bus to, to, to school as usual. Um, yeah, one time I would <laughs> take the bus, do a trip or two with him, and then be dropped off at the lane and go to GBSS. But that morning at the petrol station in Grand Mall, somebody say, where you all going? The country shut down. But my father doesn't listen to me much, so. Eventually, I went to, to school, and there was much, not much students in GBSS. We stood on top of the hill and watched down on the roundabout, and there were jeeps flying around with people with guns in it, and a call, there was stopping uh, uh, vehicles searching them, and there was a call on the radio for people to join the Revolutionary Forces. I remember we stood there watching for a while, and then we kind of went back home. When we got home, the announcements on the radio was going on. This is revolution for free food, free necessities, a people revolution, etc., etc and the call to join the revolutionary forces in your area. And as a youth, I wanted to join, like you, who wanted to join, but mom said, eh, eh. 
So we were, we, we were not um, able to join, but certainly the country was really excited about the, the change. And as far as I recall, on the, that night, when the actual revolution happened and six hours in which the, the, the army and the police were taken, the barracks, there were no killing. I think the following day is when somebody came out, the, the innocent Belma, the head honcho that used to terrorize and gave his name, apparently he not surrendered and came out firing and he, was, he died the day after. So that was my student's recollection of that day, that image of watching the the van speeding around Tantin on the boat, I can never forget that, with the flags and the heel grenade and revolutionary chants. That was uh, the moment that is mine. Thank you. Like uh, Mr. Noel, I was in primary school. It doesn't look like it, eh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, was, I was in primary, I was actually six years old at the time, and um, I, I recall I was transferred from <laughs> primary school in, in, uh, in Grand Ends to a, a school in St. George's, in town. So it was a big day for us, that, that Tuesday, my sisters and I, we go into a town school, and then the principal came and said, no school, go back home. Well, you know, we, we couldn't question the principal, she says no school. Uh, no school, but we were really disappointed. So we returned home. She gave us no reason why there was no school. We heard a few things on the radio. Um, by then, I think the station had, had been renamed to Radio Free Grenada. But what I could recall, later in the afternoon, um, we were at the shop, the village shop, probably buying bread or something, but hardly anybody was inside the shop. Everybody seemed to be outside the shop, and cars were flying up and down the Grand Dance Road. And what was strange to me, even at six years old, I, all the cars were filled, and to my six-year-old mind, everybody held a guitar. Because I saw what looked like the guitar, <laughs> the guitar handle sticking out the windows. So I'm thinking, well, there must be a big concert somewhere. What's, what, what's happening? It was later on I realized, you know, these were weapons that we were holding, and the straps and things like that, that I recognized as guns. But um, yeah, we, we that day changed, you know, Grenada for better or for worse. But it changed Grenada one way or the other, and, and the lives of every individual. So we're going to focus on on how that happened with respect to women. But secondary school students played a major role uh, in the in the development of the revolution on the day, in the weeks after, the months after, even in the years after. Um, I'd like to pose the question to the panelists who were in secondary school at the time. Um, so what was the typical life of a secondary school student during in the first few months after March 13th? Yeah, let, let <laughs> and, and um, oh. right, so system, I tell you, we're going above that. Um, well, I'm really happy to see the age group of the um, attendees here. Um, at the time of the revolution for us, um, many of us who became very active in the process, I want us to think of the revolution as a process. Huh? And so to understand it as a process, I just want to go back what school was like for us then. Now, at that time, um, the lucky few who were able to get into secondary school, because I know prior to that, even during the period of um, Gary's reign, he really exposed secondary education to the mass of Grenadians. But there was a fee involved if you did not get what we call at the time a scholarship, right? If you didn't pass with what is a scholarship. So me for many of us who passed with a scholarship, we did not have to pay any school fees. In fact, I remember in the very, I think it was Form 1, uh, we got a grant or a bursary, $30 or something. $30, which we hid from our parents, of course, because that was our money, right? But basically, we got a grant. And um, so the school, uh, what, when I went into high school, the, most of the, many of the schools in Grenada, in particular, um, 
had what we call stu active student councils, but a lot of other student organizations. So there were dance group, drama group, communication club, science clubs. Many of the clubs we um, worked together with um, the GBSS, uh, as high school GBSS, so there's a sort of high school GBSS, science club, communication club, you name Drama it. Sports. Drama, yeah. sports, everything. So because of that situation, we had a lot of organization of students. Now here today, people complain and say, I don't know what's going on in the school, students are not organized, and I normally say to them, you know, it's a different era, different priorities, different type of situation. At that time, we were rallying around something. We had the type of teachers in the school who were very active in the black power movement, for example, and the anti-Gary struggle. And they were real resource uh, persons who not only helped to organize us, even though they were sort of civil organization, you know, basic um, interest organization, they were able to organize us into many of these um, clubs and societies that um, outside of the guides and the girl guides and the scouts and all the things that the other school would have had. So we had also organized, even at the high school level, a cadet corps. It was the first female cadet corps. I think um, we practiced with GBSS. I've spent lots of the time up there because we really enjoyed that, that sort of um, relationship that we had. So there were, uh, students were involved in a lot of stuff. We had debates between houses, between schools, all of that type of um, organization. So because of, with the role of the type of instructors that we had who were very active in the um, anti-Gary struggle, we learned a lot about international affairs, African liberation, et cetera, et cetera. So we were very versed on a lot of the freedom fighting that took place all over the world, particularly in Africa, because remember it was um, coming out of the black power movement where the, the, the theme was black is beautiful, we're black and proud, et cetera, et cetera. Really conscious raising type of um, activity. So that was, um, and with all of the debates, and so, so that was the, the mood and the tone. So when the revolution occurred, and even prior to that, we had established a national student council. And that student council was more political, although much of what was fought for at the time was um, school book, um, you know, Right, so a lot of things that focus in on the school itself, because coming out of that high school situation and the, the, the period of Eric Gary, high school was burnt flat, right? I think I can't remember what year it was, but when I, get, when I got there, they were building back mm -hmm. and things like that. So the student council put a lot of effort into building back. And so uh, there was a big sort of divide, tongue and country divide, and you hear it, the tongue children versus the country, and it was a ridiculous situation. And what the student council then, even prior to the revolution, was trying to do was to reduce that type of, um, that type of divide that existed between the tongue and country. So the national student council helped a lot to do that because it involved, like the president was, um, a guy from St. David's School, the vice president, somebody from McDonald College, the, and the various officers. So it spread out and that sort of, um, sort of was beginning to reduce this divide that existed. So when the revolution came, we were very much well into organization already. We were beginning to learn leadership, participation, and things like that. So it be, the, the student council through which I did most of my political work then, the student council evolved into taking some leadership role in organizing young people and um, taking, um, and when the revolution came, the sort of confidence that the revolutionary government gave to us as students, right? And that's and, and that the spirit I'm talking about. If you did not experience a revolution, you may, may not understand the depth of the spirit that existed then. You did not have to call us out twice. Because as Peggy May mentioned, in the, during the um, Gary period, the schools and the students played a major role in all the demonstration and the collapse of the Gary's regime. So it was a continuation of that type of um, 
especially invigorated by the, the, um, what was happening with apartheid in South Africa and African liberation. And so the student council took on the role of having rallies and discussions and seminars, Free Nelson Mandela, um, upper, um, exposing the, the ills of the apartheid system, understanding the African National Congress and all of those types of act, uh, conscious raising activities sort of drew more and more students into the whole mix. So students were very, I would say they were active prior to the revolution and became much more active. And <clears throat> sorry, the increased activity had a lot to do with the policy of the new government that included us in everything. <clears throat> and not yeah. only did they include us in decision making, but they gave, gave us as, as, as young people or, or students and youth an office a youth office. I remember we were even given by the Minister of Education at the time, Jacqueline Kreff, we were given a bus so that we can have our meetings in various parishes every Saturday. So we alternated our student council's meeting. And what was the result of that? We developed bond with students from all over Grenada, very strong bond to the point where we even became familiar with their families. We would go to the families after meeting and eat, get fruits, get vegetables. So it was a, a really good bonding. But it is that sort of level of cooperation and contribution that they made in terms of the bus and, and office space and all of that gave us a sort of uh, legitimacy and room to participate. So I'll stop there. <laughs> no. Yes, yes, Wendy. Wendy, you're taking, you're taking me back. You're, you're taking the memory back and certainly accurate that feeling of empowerment. For example, we used to have the, um, the National Student Council rally once a year in Queen's Park. Students from all secondary school, like a little intercall, right? Free food. <laughs> Presentations by student councils, right? And dance and culture, yes. And, and students felt powerful. I mean, we were actually doing things and we felt a part of a national movement, right? And it's only our parents tempering us in, in the involvement, you know, and the military side especially. So um, budget consultation. I remember going down to the, was it the dome at the time? Dome. The dome. And participating in a budget consultation. And I don't know anything what a budget is <laughs> for a nation, but through that, you know, involvement and participation and listening to my brother, older brothers and sisters who knew more, we were able to contribute in a meaningful way, but more so the administration contributed to us feeling empowered to make a difference. I just wanted to say what Wendy was saying, we started that at school, so they continued because when we left school, we were so involved from school from the Anakin High School. We were leading in that. But we had student council and they continued so that when the revolution took place, we were, the young people in Grenada were so already involved that they got involved more. So. Uh, thank you. Um, and we see a really nice audience of young people here this afternoon in Hospitality Hall. And um, it's great that you're showing such an interest in our history, because now you'll know what lessons you could learn from that history and perhaps not make the same mistakes in the future and um, perhaps build on um, the good that came out of the experiences from that day. Now, the panelists spoke about the, the organizations that they participated in, particularly Student Council. I remember one organization, the National Youth Organization, there was a jingle uh, that, that has always stuck with me over the years um, because it looked as if the, the government really wanted the youth to participate and participate act actively. There was also another organization for women, the NWO. NWO. Uh, can you speak about the NWO a bit? What was that about? What were perhaps some of the objectives? Um, was National Women's Organization. Well. As you know, or you should know, we hold half of the sky up. And women, and I'm not being <laughs> rude to the men that are here, 
but women are so organized from home that you know they can do many tasks. And our men are slow at that. We could do combing hair, cooking, doing everything at one time. I mean, it's a fact. So we are very in organized. And if you are involved in any organization with men and women, women are the ones that carry it. And it is a fact. So women were very involved in the revolution. Before the revolution, we had newspapers that we had to hide to sell. And it's the older women that used to do it, much older women. They used to do that. They used to be doing all sorts of things, women. So the National Women Organization was very powerful in the community, doing all sorts of things. In the revolution, we had a lot of volunteering. And I wish that could come back in Grenada because it's so very important. We had volunteering in, in doing community work, volunteering in doing what you call Center for Popular Education, that was CP. And CP was a real pillar of the revolution because you have people today who would be now retiring and so that became, who couldn't read and write, who became nurses, doctors, policemen, all sorts of careers. So that was very important, CPE in the country at the time. And you had students that used to be teaching to, but you had a population that they can speak, but they couldn't read. So you had a lot of people getting mails from the people away and they could not read it. Somebody had to read it, some people were cheating them. So that, that was a very important thing. But women were very involved in the revolution, in the government, in the party, in the community, doing all sorts of work. And that was a pillar, one of the greatest pillars of the revolution, women involvement. And today, I think women are still, but as young people, we should get involved. Whether it's in schoolwork, in the community, start something, start a, to help somebody in the community, help an elderly person, do something, because we really need to bring back that kind of voluntary work in our country to build it, get involved. Amen has a lot of projects he's doing, deliver and last suggest, whatever it is, whatever project or things you see, talk to your friend and get involved. But women were very important. We had the student council and you had um, youth, con U N U NYO. NYO, and then we had what you call the pioneers, the flowers of the revolution, which most of the women were did. So the kids were involved in a lot of work. They weren't idle, there was not no phone. They was dealing with, you know, doing creative things, whether we had phone or not, but they were so creative and brought out a lot of their creativity. They used to talk, not be talking, real talking, culture came out of, of, and people, I mean, it was really inspiring. We are empowered. So I wish women would get more involved, whether it's at school or a community church or any organization, you hold up half of the sky or maybe more than half now. Hi, right, I'll just add a few. Um, and my information is really based on primary and secondary sources and so on. Um, as far as the women is concerned as the organization. And um, I would realize that there was, um, from since 1977, what we call a PWA, which is a Progressive Women Association. And um, it appears though that this group would have been operating, um, it was said, without the molestation of um, Gary, despite there was oppos opposing um, Gary. Um, some of this information is in this book I saw. Um, here with the name of Women in Grenadian History, 1783 to 1983 by Dr. Nicole Phillip, a historian here in Grenada. And, um, so, and they had certain aims and objectives. Uh, some of those were, and that's prior to the actual um, re uh, revolution itself, which is to raise the progressive consciousness of, consciousness of women, the struggle to achieve material and other benefits for women, better wages and working condition for women, equal pay for working, women, employment opportunities, proper housing, and many more, and so forth. Um, some of these things were, li were later on um, adapted by the revolution itself, um, when the revolution came on stream. And uh, it appears though Morris uh, was f played frequent visits to them, and tend to associate himself with them. 
Um, but it would appear later on that the revolution saw this group as a kind of threat towards the revolution um, when you're talking about a socialist movement um, operating under a one-party state system. Um, we will have the transformation later on, in which we call the National Women's Organization, I think, where we have um, um, Mr. Bernard Code's wife, which is Phyllis Code, became president of the, um, the, the National Women's Organization. And it would appear that there was some confrontation between the, the PWA and uh, uh, Phyllis Code, um, having some confrontation and some little, uh, being a little bit too arrogant towards that group, it would appear and cause some hostility between the, the both people here who was Miss um, Alice McIntyre and so forth who was involved in that group prior. Um, whatever, however, um, those are some of the personalities and some of the things that would have transpired in terms of as far as women is concerned in the group and so on. And it's important to note too, due to the fact that I did mention um, Phyllis Code here, I, know I read a, a paper from one of the advisors to Morris Bishop during the revolution from a report Bobby Clark who stated, um, but nonetheless, um, not because I'm mentioning that, that she had not contributed immensely to the development of the revolution. But he had stated from the beginning of the revolution, he had predicted that the revolution was doomed to failure. And the reason why he said that was because when Maurice Bishop traveled overseas to gain funds for the, the revolution, get looking for um, help for Grenada, while he was out, Unison Whiteman was also in Jamaica trying to get nurses to come to Grenada to help develop the health industry, health, health sector. Um, it was said that Phyllis Code went on the radio and said that there will be a meeting, call a meeting from the Central Committee, and this meeting would be chaired by the Deputy Prime Minister of Grenada, which is Bernard Code. So he was hinting that there was no decision that was made prior. I don't know how true that is, but that was revealing that paper, there was no decision made, taken, by the authorities to name Bernard Code at that time yet as, as, um, as deputy um, prime minister and so on. But she mentioned it and it remained that way until they never dealt with it. And he was invited to Grenada on many occasions as being an advisor to Morris to deal with that situation, which they was never able to deal dealt with um, and so forth and because of the fact, the, the makeup of the Central Committee and so forth. I just want to quickly say some things about the NWO with regards to, that's a, just as we had the National Youth Organization that organized the youth and students, there was the National Women's Organization that organized the women. And there's some major achievements made by um, for you to understand, really, because this is a totally different historical period, right? If you try to, I don't know, you could try to imagine and understand what the situation was like for women. Remember, because um, when Gary came in, in 51, women were working alongside the men in the, in the estates, menial wage, so many of them home, at home, it, things were really bad. And so Gary made a major change. So there's a strong loyalty to Gary's government by Grenadian women. Women have always led a lot of, lots of stuff, right? On the estates, fight for better pay, fight for better working condition, fight for the children, fiercely fight for the children and the men. So women have always played that major role. So when the revolution came, just as, um, as indicated, um, and as the youth, women also had little organization. But here now, the NWO targeted the grassroots women, while Gary targeted the agricultural women and the women who were at home, et cetera. And um, the progressive organization cha um, targeted more the literate middle class women. The revolution targeted the real working class type of women in the communities, the hardcore workers, Right, um, the women who holding up the homes and the workplaces and so throughout Grenada, and so um, because of that situation, one of the one of the early things that the the, the formation of the National Women's Organization led to was the establishment of a women's desk. Right, had leading women 
So it was beginning to formalize the organization of the women. And so some of the things women were involved in in developing their own cooperatives because of the employment situation. Um, women were involved in a lot of voluntary projects. And if you try and understand the situation again, we did not have maternity leave law. We did not have maternity leave law. Women could make babies and have to go to work next week or tomorrow, okay? Maybe they can get three months leave to take care of that baby, two of which of those months were paid leave. Um, the revolution also established a national insurance scheme, which is a contributory scheme. So in the event of illness or even maternity, women were able to be paid for that third month that they're not paid. And they can get sickness benefit over 26 weeks, et cetera, et cetera, a whole range. You can familiarize yourself with the NIS situation. But what came out of that, at that time we had no official daycare pre-primary school, et cetera, and the NWO led the way in establishing in Grenada a number of pre-primary schools, a number of um, daycare centers, they trained workers for these. Women were just involved. You know, think about you're in a situation where you're not given an opportunity and you want an opportunity, and here an opportunity arise to participate in every aspect, particularly the things that will change the quality of life. Women were the driving force behind all of these. So it was a lot of um, uh, don't, things like the community volunteering and community service. Women were involved in that. There, were even end up, there was a slogan, NWO, equal in defense. Lots of women joined the, the, the uh, military the organization, militia. the militia and the People's Revolutionary Government. Lots of, lots of women were involved in all of the cleaning up of the community and painting of the walls and bridges and every Sunday cleaning, cleaning up the schools, painting schools, etc. So there's a lot of, lot of involvement because here is an opportunity to get involved in a, in a sort of open way. So there were things like uniform program, new preschools, new daycare, training workers for such things, and of course somebody mentioned the CP and other stuff. So it, it targeted a, a different group of women, and because of that, with that opportunity, just as we felt with youth and students, here is an opportunity to participate fully in your country's development, and the response was phenomenal. It's hard for you to kind of picture it. You have to experience it and live it to feel that spirit that kept people involved at all possible levels. So um, I don't know if anybody. Yeah. <laughs> what? I learned a lot of things just now, you know. <laughs> so um, even uh, we can't take for granted, you know, a lot of the the privileges, so to speak, that young parents are experiencing today with respect to where they leave the children to go to work. And, and um, or where they might leave the children to go study here at Tam CC to do evening classes and things like that. Um, by the way, if you have questions, uh, members of the audience, you can put up your hand, and at any time we're going to take your questions and your comments at any segment. But we've been hearing about all of these policies and programs that uh, were implemented by the PRG. But we would like to know who are some of the, the women who were involved. It, it's always important for us to recognize people. So can we call names? Who are some of the important women in the revolution? Not necessarily in the actual PRG, but the women who made a difference. Um, perhaps we could start with Mr. Noel, and uh, we could, yeah. Yeah, I'd just um, like to mention some um, Im important people. Let me say Peggy. Peggy is one of them. <laughs> yeah. But um, when we think of the revolution, I know it is mentioned that um, young intellectuals, and for, for the most part, I think um, we tend to always look at the men in terms of the role as the intellectuals in the revolution. But among them, there were some highly intellectual women, in my view, that sometimes tend to be overlooked. Um, and one of those uh, would be um, Jacqueline Kreff, who had a political science degree at the time and was, I find it very difficult to actually, was heavily victimized, by the way, by the Eric Gehry regime and had to resort to Trinidad to look for a job. 
prior to the revolution. And um, she became later on the Minister of Education and so forth and made um, significant contribution um, to the revolution and to Grenada's development um, later on. She was assassinated along with Maurice Bishop and she was one of those people. Um, another of these people was the very same uh, Phyllis Cole, who was actually, I think she was a lecturer at the University of the West Indies at some point in time, and taught at Andy Ken High School, Dr. Grenard mentioned it, yeah. <laughs> um, and she did a lot of work in the NWO, the National Women Organization, uh, Jamaican born. And um, she wrote, I think she wrote a book, couple books, um, yeah, and she did wrote a couple books. And then we had some other personalities which were Decima, Decim, Dr. Decimal Williams, who was uh, the ambassador to the, to the OS at the time. Um, Dr. Decimal Williams now is the president of the Senate in Grenada, um, and so forth. So these so some of the people from an intellectual point of view that I would say that were some of the women intellectuals that were involved. They might, uh, they might have been more intellectuals, women who were involved, and maybe the other panelists might know them and be able to highlight them. But there are other people um, we have, uh, that would, they, they would mention some of the other people like Peggy and so on and these other people, but these are some of the intellectuals. <laughs> you see my hair? <laughs> I remember some. Okay, we have people like Gloria Payne Banfield, um, Faye Rapier, Clavis Charles, Vira McQueen, Monica Hardin, Pamela Steele, Dorcas Braveboy. But one of the things I want to mention is that when the revolution took place in government, most of the people in the leadership positions were mostly men. After the revolution, you had the most PSs, permanent secretaries, were women. Up to today, you still see that. Even in schools, these days, you could hardly find male teachers because before they used to have a lot, but women came forward, as Wendy said. They came forward and started. We had a lot of scholarships, whether it's to Cuba, Mexico, Europe, Canada, and so a lot of scholarship was given after the revolution for ordinary people who could not afford, because before they used to have one or two, and it always went to the minister's children or somebody in high society. So the women in the revolution paved the way for you, and therefore you have to pave the way for the generation after you. They got involved, and in every aspect, even in business, when you went to, to, to business places, we were shocked. A lot of them were women. But guess what? They wasn't getting the pay that the men was getting doing the same work, and maybe the women too. So as Wendy mentioned, we had equal pay for equal work, and the maternity leave, which helped a lot of women and so. So we had a lot of women. I can't remember everybody's name now, but there were a lot of women involved in, in, in that. And the, the organization, NW, pushed a lot of programs and projects and so to government and we, the men were very, very, very good in accepting women and being equal to them. I really don't know if it's the same today. I don't find it looking like that because, because we hardly have any women in government and things like that as we had in those days. So the women was very, very involved and took part in all aspects, whether it's as a matter of fact, a lot of careers changed in those times. You had women going into agro-processing, construction, technical and vocation, women going to study economics, all sorts of areas that we never had before. So right now, a lot of them are retiring, but in Grenada in the last few years, you saw all the, 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 the evidence of what the revolution produced because they had a lot of women going away and study. Men too, but a lot of positions of people, whether it's in agriculture, whether it's in construction, whether it's in the finance, they were part of everything. And I wish you would continue that, hold up the, the half of the sky and be involved. Get into areas, non-traditional areas. We don't have to always be in the same um, kind of career. And that's very important. But women are, were a very important part of the revolution. You know, there were those of us who were around at the time, there were so many slogans 
uh, on billboards around the place about the revolution, uh, forward ever, backward, ne um, forward ever, backward, never, um, education or death, and so on. But there were some slogans about women as well. And I was glad to hear Peggy speak about women step forward. That was one of the slogans, women step forward. And we're seeing the, the many opportunities for women right now. Other, a couple of other slogans about women, uh, women equal in production and defense. Um, I remember during the invasion seeing a couple of female soldiers. And I was, I'm not sure if I was impressed, but I was surprised that they were taking up defense of the nation. Women committed to economic construction. And um, you heard Peggy mention some of the careers that, that women stepped into even after the revolution. Uh, we, we're going to take a few minutes to take some questions from the audience uh, or comments. Um, even while we do so, we must recognize in the audience the chair of the College Council, Dr. Wendy Grenard, and our principal, Dr. Ronald Brunton. Uh, so if you have questions, there's a mic in the, in the aisle where you can go up to pose something. Maybe we have questions from online audience. Okay, so I have a question from um, someone online. Gertrude Batiste is asking, what are some of the ideas from the Grenada Revolution that can be utilized in modern day Grenada? Mm -hmm. Some of the ideas from the Grenada Revolution that can be utilized in modern day Grenada. Great question. Um, I, have, I have held the position that the, one of the greatest achievements of the Grenada Revolution, and normally when I speak of the revolution, a lot of people like to speak about the end game of the revolution. I very rarely speak of the end game. It's kind of painful, but I, I speak about the process. And to me, one of the greatest achievements of the Grenada Revolution would have been the human resources that was created. Peggy um, spoke a bit of that. If you look around in Grenada right now, just about every CEO in every private company, every doctor, teacher, professor, professional economist are products of the revolution. Either would have been sent by the revolution on scholarship and came back home to serve. If you do a, a survey out there and ask just about any leader in any of the organizations in Grenada right now, whether it's private or public, you will find that head in most of these are children or flowers of the revolution, all right? So I, I still hold that it has created the greatest human resource, but there's so many things that we can learn from the revolution um, in terms of leadership qualities. The training that we would have received in the short four and a half years in terms of being able to organize and represent and, and the level of confidence that the, the, the revolution instilled in us as young people. Remember guys, the people who led the revolution were in their 20s and early 30s was young people. We the students were even younger than most of you inside here because we were in, we were in early stages of high school, right? Um, I, I think about, um, the, 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 this college that exists now, it came out of a product of the revolution, for example, the Institute for Further Education. It was established um, when the, the, um, the PRG decided because of the deficiency in some of the sixth form colleges or the absence of sixth form colleges in other parishes, they decided to bring all students who are doing A-levels under one umbrella body. It was called the Institute for Further Education. So it was people like Mr. McIntyre, Mr. Brizan, and these people who were leading these top educators in Grenada um, were the instructors there. And the, the whole idea of IFE was that people going to IFE, it's almost automatic that they're gonna get scholarships to go to universities and study. So it, the focus on creating that human resource to me, uh, and so the importance and the need to continue that. But it's a human resource that was created that returned to Grenada to serve, even though it may not be permanently, and that is a lesson I think that we should learn. We have to find a way of instilling in our people
So let us um, see how best we can deploy that to ensure. And that is why I guess the focus was on so much scholarships, training, every single person who was capable and able were able. It was a dream because for many students in Grenada, maybe as much as 90%, university was out of the question. Further training was out of the question. And the revolution gave us that, that hope, that dream, that passion to really contribute to our country and to see the importance of patriotism. I'm sure you have something to add. <laughs> Thank you, very accurate and good memory. Yes, what can we, for me, I'll just choose one, freedom, the concept of freedom. Um, what freedom meant, revolutionary free Grenada, one of the first act was to rename the radio station um, Radio Free Grenada, right? And um, the revolution started moving towards the ideal. Now the ideal may be to recover the lifestyles we had before slavery. Because if you realize, every attempt we've made since, since Federal Rebellion, since Emancipation, since Independence, since no, every attempt we have made to turn away from the grips of slavery have always kept us still in slavery. Every prime minister and leader and hero who stood up and said, let's fight, and we joined them, and they did a bit of good, including the last two administrations, they've all fallen. And the reason for this is because we have not returned to what we call Freedom. What is freedom if you're buying your daily bread? What is freedom if you have to pay for the roof over your head? What is freedom if you have to pay for your education, your medical care? You are not free. You are a deep slave. Because all other creatures, 8.7 million, they, they live freely. So the revolution said free milk program. Remember the free school feeding program, free house we pray, where they used to deliver the material and we volunteers will go and help repair people's houses. They, they started the freedom and to get to the point where when all of us have our daily bread freely available, who teething from who? And of course, luxuries will be paid for by money, by printed piece of paper, perhaps with our grandmother help on it, right? So this, this step towards freedom, it's an ongoing process. And right now, I've been talking to students, they have two problems. Stress from schoolwork, and they have no money. They're in the machines, right, in 16 hours a day. You're either ducking something, you have to get something, you have to avoid something, you have to shoot something. So they're all selfish, like me, I have to survive in this horrible, horrible world of my machine. And therefore, our students are frustrated. The revolution brought us together in communities. We couldn't wait for the truck to pass around to jump on and go and volunteer, whether it's cleaning the community, whether it's repaying somebody's house, whether it's distributing milk. And yes, I was a part of so many things I can hardly remember, but I remember teaching in CPE, you know? And I remember people coming to me many, many years later and say, you know, you taught me, oh yeah, you know? We were involved, there was purpose, and we were trying to achieve freedom, free Grenada. Mm. I'm not gonna talk about the pain. <laughs> Uh, just on that, it was students just like you who manned the Center for Popular Education program. That was the literary program. I remember I had two students, 
a 60 something year old lady and her daughter, 40 something year old. I'll go twice a week to Boca, take two buses to get there, spend an hour or so. At the end of the program, at least they were able to identify the name, able to write the name, and able to sign the name. That's as much as I could remember. I'm not sure what is it. But it was a good, gener it was a good the generational um, exchange, right? Because they tell you all the stories about their own existence. And so, you know, they brought you through a journey while you just simply, um, so, you know, there was a slogan, of who no teach who, who don't know learn, or something like that. And it was the students in Grenada you found all over Grenada. In fact, the youngest CP student was a 12-year-old guy from Karaku. Yeah. You remember Adams. him? Adams. Right, Adams, right. He was 12 years old, and he was the youngest teacher, and he had a 70-something-year-old teacher or whatever. Of Princeton. Yeah, right. He was the youngest, and he was 12. And most of the, the teachers were 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, very, very few above that from the school um, situation. Mm -hmm. So that is a level of involvement. And we had to do that like twice a week in most cases. We're going to sit the, um, these people's home. Most of them don't have electricity. They don't have, don't have running water. They have their daily life to live and yet found time to sit down not only to talk to you about their own situation and living, but to learn how to read and write. And so it's a lot of these types of activities. In fact, the person who led uh, is a woman, um, or some women who led the, um, the CP. I remember Valerie Cornwall, I remember Mul Mul Hodge, 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 Mul Hodge from Trinidad, because we had a lot of people coming from the region coming to help um, the literary program and did it because Jews as the as a male, so uh, that level of involvement and it was the student council, mm -hmm. the youth organization, mm -hmm. the NWO that mobilized people because most of the the, the, the teachers of the CPU are women, yes, right, and led very much by women, so and young people. So there is a ro there was a role for all of us. Yeah. Okay, I just want to mention two things: the, what we could take and do now as Wendy and MC volunteering is very important. The community development work, whether it's in, the, in churches, in the organizations, they have a lot of cancer, kidney, everything. Please try to get involved. All the people that are there are getting like me and we have to rest too. <laughs> so we need people to get involved in all these civil organization and medical organization. But one of the greatest things we can do is to learn to organize. We need a skill of organization, and we had that in the revolution. Patriotism, what is national pride? Service. Service is so important. And if we do that without thinking of we have to get a penny or five cents, I would have been a millionaire 15 times over for the work I did before and the work I still do today. I just eat and I'm living, and that's what all that is important. You know, I don't have any riches. but. You, if you're happy, and I am very happy helping and doing things, but we need the younger people to come and start giving service with, in anything, whether it's in church, we have kidney association, we have cancer association, we have all these things. We need to get the people involved, and that is what we could learn today. Without the money, service. Thank you. Thank you. We have a question. Uh, I'm curious, since you all were there, you were on the ground, which is, I mean, I bow to you <laughs> for all of your work and contribution. Um, what would you say is the difference between the general tenor in the island in 1979, the years leading up to 1979, and now? And, and I ask because from my humble perspective, um, as, a, as an outsider, born in Grenada, but grew up in the States, it appears to me that there was a need, a dire need then. That, and I still think there is a dire need now, but I feel like there's not the sense in the masses of the population that see that there's a dire need now because 
there's so much in Grenada that there wasn't before. There's cell phones mm. and flat screen TVs mm. and lots of vehicles on the island. So do you feel that there's a sense of urgency now as there was then? And is there any inkling of hope that Grenada can rise again to its former revolutionary glory? Um, of course, there's always hope. Where there's life, there's always hope. So uh, we're not worried. But I always say to people, think of, it's a different environment, a different situation. Some of the things we have to remember with the collapse of the revolution, those who hated the revolution did not sit idly by. They made sure they had a well-designed program to change our focus, to change our priority, for us not to look at things and the ways that we were looking at it. And that, I mean, there's an active psychological war, including, uh, 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 as, as um, Amen said, including um, the, 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 anyway, the psychological war that um, created a sort of environment and atmosphere, and the individualism that was developed. So we move from a situation of collective action. We never thought about ourselves. You know how our parents stress? And when they realized they couldn't handle and couldn't deal with it, they just gave up because there is nothing they would have said that could have kept young people out of building our country. They worried, how are you guys gonna survive? How are you gonna live? You can't be given all that you have. We did not, so that kind of collective action that we had but what has happened since the collapse of the revolution is a promotion of individualism. It's a, it's a, a competition among people. So it's not a, a collaborative work, right? And um, that, that competition, um, for example, prior to the revolution, high school couldn't stand convent, PBC couldn't stand GBSS for young people, it was always a big war. During the revolution time, my best friends came from convent, surprisingly, my best friends came from PBC, that kind of thing because of that um, breaking that barrier, right? And so that individualism that was promoted since the collapse of the revolution and that desire to look outside, not within our country, that is why we don't even have history being taught in, our, in most of our schools. We have all kind of other things bombarding and we have to under, we can't blame the young people for the position that you are in today. That's development, society is gonna move forward. So we have to find creative ways of maintaining that patriotism, maintaining that collective spirit that we have always, that has defined our country. That we didn't used to have to pay for um, childcare, you drop your child by a cousin or a friend, and they will be taken care of as if it's their own. We didn't know you had to pay for things like that, but the individualism and the profiteering and the setting up us against each other because of that focus has created a product today, but it's not all loss because we have the creative um, aspect of society where we can bring back the teaching in a different form, utilizing the very medium that the young people like, right? And so it, it, there, I, I could never give up hope because I always say, and I sit with my students all the time, every generation is smarter than the generation before them, all they're smarter than us. Much, much, much smarter, much more creative, much more on the ball. All you have the technology, all you have all the information at your fingertip. That we had to scrum to find out what the hell is the ANC, what is Soweto, where is that, right? All you don't have to do that. Right at your fingertip, you have everything you need. It's harnessing that energy and that knowledge now. And we can use the creative um, route in order to do that because that's what young people like. You're turned on by anything creative or technology. So those are the things we have to use now, as far as I'm concerned. So it's really not hopeless. It's just um, setting the proper direction. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yep, that is that. <laughs> yep, yep, yep. Yep. Um, not, not hopeless. I feel when I see the destruction coming, I would like to avoid it. So I walk towards solution so it's not hopeless thank you thank you <laughs> Crawford um, some people have to depart
the, to reach our students with, with a message that would uh, bond them together again is, is, is the objective now. And we, we, I don't know if there's any um, active body doing this. When we came here, um, it was free. Education was free. And we had to pay for the GCE overseas exams. Um, so that's what we paid for. And of course, your bus fee and so on. But, but they removed fees from secondary schools and all schools, except private schools. All government and, 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 and church-based schools in Grenada, the fees was removed for the students. So the pressure was off, and we all went about, and I'd say scholarships and so on was increased by vast amounts, right? So um, now the school fees are back on. Um, but as I said, I wouldn't talk about the pain today. We have another occasion for that. All right, Ambrose. Yeah, I'm happy to say that um, at this School of Art Sciences and Professional Studies, we do offer the history of Grenada among the courses, as one of the courses among the courses. And uh, mm -hmm. yeah. in fact, this morning, in this morning the, the students of that class um, enjoyed a session with our own Dr. Wendy Grenard. Uh, she spoke about the revolution and uh, gave them some, some good history. Uh, together, of course, with, the, with the, the Caribbean studies, one of the Caribbean studies uh, classes. Also, it is a requirement for students of the TA Marshall D College to complete some hours, 30 hours, I believe, of community service in order for them to graduate. And I know you've, you've got some good ideas, in fact, some great ideas from the panelists on what you could do to uh, meet that requirement. And don't just stop at 30 hours. Even after you graduate, you should continue with the community service. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to put the panelists on the spot now. We've, we've been talking about um, what the revolution has done for women and uh, uh, how that has impacted the lives of women even right now. But let's look at it from the other side. What were, in your opinion, some, some weaknesses or perhaps shortcomings of the revolution with respect to how the PRG you know, um, dealt with women? You know, we have to look at that as well. <laughs> Who wants to touch that? <laughs> I'll go with you. Um, to me, um, a major shortcoming was the not giving women enough time for themselves, their family, etc. A typical day in, well, I know for youth and of course for women as a woman who was a, a, a youth, um, <laughs> there was never time. One of the things that the revolution was insisting was um, your main role, and that's what it would tell us as students, your main role of contribution to this revolution is to study and pass all exams, right? And as I said, our parents worried because we had we had NW, NYO meeting, we had students meeting, we had activities, we had what are called zonal council, we had parish council. So just about a, then um, CPE and then community service on Sundays. So every single day of the week there was something to do. So you had very little time for family, for your children, for, for wives or their husbands, etc. right? And I think that was one of the main, um, there was a riff in with the NWO and the party at some point because the NWO was saying, we need time. We need to spend time with our children. And if we are expected to be involved in all of this, although if voluntarily, you know, it cuts into the time that you could um, spend with your family. So I think not enough focus was given on family life development and it created a lot of rift in families and with spouses as one, as one area. Thank you. Yeah, I think that I agree with Wendy and what she was saying. But um, I think because it was new and you so want to get your country going and develop mm -hmm. that sometimes you, you didn't even think. I, I remember days you're getting up and you're out from six, seven, and you're gone home by eight, nine in the night and sometimes come a leader will call, I need a file or something. I learned to do filing system 
from that because I felt bad to call ordinary people who were working in the system to come out and get a five at 10 or 11 in the night because the common leader doing work and he wants to, 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 to get a five. So, but we did not realize the importance of, of and most people were, were single in the sense, but who were, were, had families, it created a problem in a way. But I remember we babysit for some of the people who had children. Even if you, you know, they go to a meeting, they'll bring it to the evening, you were doing something. We had that kind of system that you had evenings and so you would babysit for that. So because you wanted to get things done and there was so much to do, I think you didn't realize that you wasn't getting some time for yourself, whether it's to, to, to socialize or to, um, to exercise. So it, it, that was a, a problem in, within the revolution. But we made by I'm still living and I'm strong. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Just just gonna make a just a quick point. And in terms of the weaknesses, in my view, um, I would say that some of the laws that was implemented in terms of to empower women, okay. which was uh, equal pay for equal work and the money, uh, maternity leave law and so on, um, there were. In, based on what I was told, some, some cases it was never really implemented, uh, uh, really, that, that was what I was told. So that possibly could have been a, um, a weakness, um, it may, and maybe in some cases it were, and some cases it weren't. So uh, it would have, have later on probably demoralized women to a certain extent and so forth. Amen, you have anything to say? All right, but the whole idea, I think, that of the revolution, we are trying to do too much, and so it stressed out a, a, a particular group of people, these very active people. Yeah. They were at, at your ends in terms of um, capacity. It's just yeah. to, to scale twice. Yeah, it, it, it sounds like um, a lot on, on really a few people. Yeah. So uh, this is quite a lively discussion. Obviously, we can't go uh, for the whole day. And uh, we're, we're, <laughs> we're just about run out of time. But I want to bring your attention to the display and that is behind us, and also in the in the lobby of this room, the lobby of the hospitality hall, you see some pic some pictures, pictorial displays, and the displays are put together by our own Peggy Nesfield right here, and she also has some books, books about the revolution. So it, 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 you have to you have to see that before you leave, and she has requested that you don't take pictures of those. Of the displays, and these are delicate things. You, know, you don't want to touch them as well. So this is like a mobile museum. You don't want to uh, touch the exhibits. I wish to thank. Mm -hmm. I wish to thank the audience for tuning in. Those of you who have tuned in online, those of you who have tuned in on GBS TV, I wish to thank the live audience for being here. I want to thank the production team of GIS for once again accommodating the TM Marshall Community College for the third time in this academic year. If you may recall, in November, we did a, a, a discussion on TM Marshall. In February, we did a discussion around independence. And so today, March 15th, we are just wrapping up a discussion on the revolution, particularly women in revolution. Uh, we are very grateful to the members of the panel, Mr. Amen, Mr. Noel, Dr. Wendy Crawford Daniel, and uh, of course, Ms. Peggy Nesfield for offering the ideas, the expertise, sharing the experiences, because some of us um, did experience more of the revolution than the rest of us, and uh, we are very pleased with this particular discussion. Students, we hope that you learned a lot. Maybe you could write a report to your lecturers about this and um, check out check out the the recordings after they're posted by GIS. They're always there on, on I suppose on um, on YouTube. So thank you very much, members of the audience, those who've come from far and wide to be with us. Thank you for your questions. We wish you all the best, and we're signing off from Hospitality Hall at the TM Marshall Community College, Tantine Campus. I'm David Ambrose, Associate Dean, SCSPS. Thank you.